we now have the pleasure of welcoming our grand témoin, who is working with a major player from the agri-food value chain. Agnès, please join me on the stage. Agnès, Agnès, I need my mic, please. Mic, please, thank you. Agnès D'Antoni is Director of Public Affairs and Sustainable Development for Cronenberg from the Carlsberg Group. She previously worked for 15 years at the Danning Company. Mrs. D'Antoni, we thank you for accepting to share your thoughts with us on the questions we have explored today, such as why and how can we move away from chemical pesticides while ensuring production that is safe and affordable to all. It's my pleasure to give you the floor for your analysis and your reactions to what has been presented and discussed today. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. So it's really a great honor for me uh, to be there with you today. Uh, and I would like to thank Christian uh, for inviting me as grand témoin. So my testimony will be, as you will see, uh, very different uh, from all you have heard today because I have nothing to do with, um, my background is so different from yours. But my career path led me to build bridges between worlds that I never imagined could be linked. I studied political science and history before joining a philanthropic organization called La Fondation de France. As you said, then I joined Danone where I spent 50 years, including five years uh, in the company's research center. And it was there that I discovered the magical world of bacteria which opened my mind to new and unexpected territories. At the time, the research was focused on probiotics. The aim was to study their impact on human health. Then came the huge work on the intestinal microbiota with a European research program called METAHIT that was coordinated by INRA and of which Danon was a partner. And the purpose was to sequence the genome of the gut. At the time, we discovered that the gut was our second brain, having more neurons than the one inside our brain. That we hosted 10, ten times more bacteria in our gut than the number of cells in our entire body. We found different enterotypes and observed that some of them were more protective of human health than others. That the diversity of bacteria in our gut was crucial to the proper functioning of the immune system that the intestinal microbiota was linked to certain pathology, such as autism, depression, obesity. To make it short, we discovered how much our health was dependent on the one of the huge ecosystem we host in our gut. And that is essential to preserve it throughout what we eat, but also what we breathe from the very beginning of our lives. And at that time, I became aware of our gut connection to nature and how much everything was connected from the smallest to the largest. Then I come to the agriculture. <laughs> when we started looking at agriculture at Cronenborg, I was struck by the analogies between the wool of the gut and that of the soil, and also of the plant, uh, if I consider what I've heard today. Between the function and impact of antibiotics and pesticides, and it was interesting to hear that uh, today, uh, what has been said this morning is that there is some resistance uh, to some pesticides and uh, in human health, we have discovered time, long time ago that because of too much antibiotics, much and much, much and much resistance are also appearing. For decades all over the world, humans have been depleting the soil that naturally nourished them, lowering them with yield levels that created abundant food, and undoubtedly helping reduce hunger in the world. But in doing so, we have destroyed essential ecosystems and services that nature naturally provided. Neglected for a long time, the soil is now regaining its central role, as did the digestive tract, to produce the food we need, but also to be part of the solutions to climate change. This is a huge challenge that requires the mobilization of all and to which, as a food player, we sincerely wish to contribute. Speaking today to European policymakers and 
high level scientists, I would like to share two thoughts with you today before explaining how agriculture has become a priority in Cronenberg's business model. First of all, we observe that ecology in the broadest sense has certainly become within a few years, at least in Europe, a new collective political, economic and environmental project. Even if the Ukrainian crisis brings back to the fear of a new world conflagration, it can legitimately sorry, it, and can legitimately constitute a break on the fight against climate change, it can also, on the contrary, accelerate the ecological transition in the search for solutions aimed at regaining sovereignty in several areas. As a consumer goods player subject to the world of the market economy, we must constantly balance the need to manage increasingly unpredictable costs, the imperative of growth and profitability the development of people and respect for nature in order to bring these different parameters together as well as possible. And this in a context where the consumption overconsumption model is denounced because it depletes our resources, biodiversity and disturbs the climate year after year. Yet this is the model on which global economic growth has been built since the end of the second world and which has enabled many countries to develop but we don't know yet how to replace it. Even though we observe behavioral changes that will certainly intensify, there will not be enough to meet the challenge ahead. If the model cannot be replaced, it must evolve. And this is where companies have an important, important role to play. This brings me to my second point, the link with Cronenberg and the beer product. As some of you may know Cronenburg, now part of the Carlsberg Danish Group, is one of the oldest French companies founded in 1664 in Alsace, Strasbourg, 358 years ago. This means that sustainability is in our DNA. Our economic, social, environmental and cultural footprint is indisputable. At Cronenburg, we believe that beer is at the heart of life. It is a product that creates social links. It's synonymous with conviviality, interaction, openness, sharing, pleasure. It is a living product. It's made from natural ingredients and water and is the result of a transformation cycle. It changes and evolves throughout its life cycle. This product is at the heart of a chain from barley to draft beer. Brewers support economic life. And it's a product that supports conviviality places. Brewers invest in cafes. Beer represents an important part of the turnover and keeps the cafe alive. Based on this vision, four years ago, we redefined our sustainable development policy around a belief in the interdependence between our long-term economic performance and our ability to limit our impact and create value for society as a whole and an ambition to build an integrated economic, social, and environmental project carried by the company and its brand around three main axes. Supporting the entrant channel, the entrant channel is uh, everything linked to the bar, the cafes, and the restaurants. Defending its role in the service of social links and conviviality. I think that uh, during the lockdown, we have all suffered everywhere in Europe about the lack of coffee and places just to meet again. Reduce our carbon impact, especially of our packaging, and encourage agroecological practices for major ingredients such as hops and barley. Implementing this ambition naturally leads us to change our supply model and to play a role in favor of the ecological transition. This brings me to what we are starting to do for agriculture. It all started with a project supported by the Cronenberg Foundation around hops. In 2019, I met two people who had a role of scouting. These two people are Anne Trombini, general manager of the Association pour une Agriculture du Vivant, and Freddy Merkling, director of the Lycée Agricole d'Aubernay, a technical high school in France who played a pilot role for agroecology. Together, we built, we built up a rather crazy project to aim for zero pesticides in hop growing. And we started with seven volunteer hops producer out of the, 50, the 45 in Alsace, bearing in mind that Alsace accounts for 
90% of French hop production. The objective, to create knowledge about new practices to experiment a new model. In parallel with this experimentation, another project emerged at the Lycée Agricole we also decided to support. A research project aimed at inventing the hop farm for the future that was focused on two objectives. First, to secure production by anticipating future problems related to global warming, the availability of resources and their quality. Secondly, to experiment with a new system of hop growing in order to store carbon, restore soil fertility, optimize water use, we introduce more biodiversity and thus reduce chemical inputs while maintaining yields. This project is at its very beginning, but it will for sure open new path for hope that hope producers all over the world will benefit from in the future. The experiment with the seven hop producers is still ongoing. First data should be shared next year. As for now, it shows that the road is long, that there is a lot of reluctance, that we must persevere, not oppose the models, and remain pragmatic. We also learned from this experience that one of the keys to sustainable change is to achieve a viable economic model for all stakeholders from upstream to downstream, that is to say, including market opportunities and the things that have been said. Depending on the type of crop, it can take more or less time. In the case of hopes, it will be long because the time of hope is long. As a very specific crop with few cultivated arc, barely 600 hectares in France, the hop industry is just starting to be structured within an interprofessional body that was created less than two years ago. That, that is not the case with barley. Eight month, 18 months ago, we decided to build a program for our flagship brand 1664 to move to 100% agroecological sourced barley. We were able to draw on the expertise of, this, of the Souffle in Vivo group, which was already involved in agroecological practices with other food players, particularly for wet cultivation, to create the first traceable responsible barley chain in France. As a result, as for 2023, 1664 blonde beer will be brewed with 20% of malt from this chain, gradually reaching 100% by 2026. Within four years, we will move from 5,000 to 25,000 tons, and from 900 to 5,000 hectares, which starts to generate a real positive impact. We have co-created with Souffle in vivo a set of specifications guaranteeing transitional agricultures as part of a, a continuous improvement process based on four pillars. Preserve the environment and in particular restore biodiversity by notably gradually reducing pesticides thanks to agroecological practices. By doing so, we will also to com contribute to protect water. Foster the reduction of the carbon footprint. Guarantee transparency on the French origin and the responsible production conditions implemented from the field to the brewer based on blockchain technology. Guarantee a fair remuneration for partner farmer and valued outlets via a financial reward to implement those commitments. This will initially involve 45 farmers, then 250. In doing so, we are co-financing the transition, also a kind of risk, and guarantee opportunities for several years. And this is key, as the whole food industry has a crucial role to play in these areas if we really want to move towards a pesticide-free agriculture. We are only at the beginning. In the long term, our ambition is to roll out the same model to all our ingredients and brands in our portfolio. Carlsberg Group should announce very strong commitments in that field as well in the near, in the near future. As a conclusion, going forward towards a zero pesticide in agriculture can be considered as a pure utopia. Nevertheless, do we have the choice? I don't think we have. For these companies need science to validate the paths they take, especially when it involves very important investments and deep transformations. They also need science to open up new territories and to push the limits to dare what has never been done. Let me quote Mark Twain, who expressed so well in a few words what is at stake. They did not know it was impossible, so they did it. 
I would like just to mention, um, some times ago, it was, uh, yes, a few years ago, I was in a conference and uh, we had um, Bertrand Picard as a special guest. And Bertrand Picard uh, explained, he, he was just launching the Solar Impulse project at the time, and it was expressed that his project was absolutely crazy. Nobody could believe that maybe it could succeed. And then uh, he wanted to find an aircraft uh, manufacturer to help him build this future plane, but he didn't find nobody because they told him that it's impossible what you want to do. So what he did, he went to see a, a ship, uh, um, uh, ah, the, the bateau, uh, a ship, yes, a ship manufacturer, and they did it because they didn't know that it was impossible, that it was impossible. So I don't know if it, the story is really true, if it happens this way. Now Solar Impulse, the project exists and the plane managed to go around the world uh, in a unlimited, for unlimited hours. But I think it's interesting to, to keep that in mind. Companies need politicians as well whose role is crucial to set the direction, avoiding changing it too often, especially when it concerns long-term or even long-term issues, but to also to remain as pragmatic as possible. This is what the debate on glyphosate has notably shown. As I am not a scientist, I would avoid giving an opinion. But sometimes politicians prohibit without sufficient attention to support alternative solutions. And some of them can even be worse than what was banned. I also, and it has been said, company needs retailer to push and valorize the, the products that are produced from sustainable practices. And I agree, it's not up to the consumer to pay for transition. Uh, it's really, I think, a collective effort, but we need, uh, to give you an example, it's a question we had with our beer, and we decided not to put the, a higher price for that. Because we think it's part of responsibility, and if we just start saying that the consumer has to pay, we will lose them. And if we lose them, we will have difficulties to make the transition happen. I will finish my speech by quoting a phrase that fully makes sense to me. In nature, a species can only thrive if everything in its environment thrives as well. In other words, it's in our hands to make our environment thrive again, to reintegrate ourselves within nature, to work with it and not against it. The microbiologist working at the Danan Research Center enjoyed saying that bacteria had created living, living beings, notable among them human beings, simply to find a place to live in, and that our free will was perhaps just an illusion. An anecdote which, by questioning the preponderant place of human beings in the chain of life, invites to a great humility. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Agnès, for this very inspiring speech. And I hope that uh, as many food companies uh, could be uh, as uh, as could be as motivated, as inspired as is the Carlsberg Group. Uh, I now hand over the floor to Christian for the conclusion. Thank you very much, everyone. It was a pleasure to be your master of ceremonies and pan panel moderator today, and enjoy the last two speakers. Thank you very much, Joanna. Yes, you, you deserve a round of applause. So we are moving to the conclusions of this very long day and after the stimulating message, and I thank really Agnès D'Antonet for uh, a very, very stimulating and also um, requiring uh, talk. Um, for the, the session, I call on the stage Philippe Mauguin, please, Philippe, and Jean-Éric Paquet for a two-voice conclusion. Um... <laughs> Philippe, Philippe Morgan is uh, CEO of Inray, and Philippe, don't sit. I, uh, you may come here right now, and uh, we are looking forward to hearing your your conclusions and your views. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, good evening, everybody, dear colleagues. Dear partners, ladies and gentlemen, dear Jean-Éric Paquet, I am delighted to be uh, with you today to share, uh, try to share some uh, concluding words after a so exciting meeting. 
Um, at the end of the day, the challenge is uh, to be not too long and try to sum up some uh, take-home message as uh, usually is done in uh, that kind of uh, symposium. So, I will uh, propose to our uh, uh, director, uh, general director of the European uh, Commission, dear Jean-Éric, um, we will propose to come back on three uh, different messages. The first one is around knowledge and innovation to meet the Green Deal objectives. The second one will be around uh, agroecological transition uh, deeply interconnected with food transition. The last speaker has uh, brilliantly shown that point. And the third message is, uh, will be around um, the need to foster science-based public policies and science-based innovation. So, um, the first message is uh, what kind of research tomorrow after that uh, symposium. Um, I think, I hope it's a common uh, conclusion, but we think with Christian that it will be essential to support, still support, basic target driven research, focusing on pesticide green deal objectives. We still have to produce plenty of knowledge. And since uh, curing is not enough, we propose to point out four research priorities. The first one is to reinforce prophylaxis. Uh, sometimes we uh, forget that, but it's uh, really important to reinforce prophylaxis through scouting and pest survey. Second priority is to develop research on advanced plant, plant breeding and with um, so many goals in the same time. Uh, the adaptation to climate change and also to crop protection uh, uh, without uh, uh, phytosanitary products. Uh, including uh, gene editing and all the uh, breeding technology. Uh, tonight, you will test our wine produced, wine from INRE, produced from grape varieties resistant to downy and powdery mildews that uh, allow us to produce uh, these varieties with minus 90%. So it's not uh, completely an utopia. Uh, and yes, and maybe tomorrow we can do that for, for beer, but at least for wine, minus 90%. And you will maybe appreciate it. Third uh, point, third priority, to meet the challenge of biocontrol and biostimulants. We, I think we, we urgently need uh, an acceleration and a scaling up of biocontrol. At, um, we, we are starting from natural-based solution, but we have to industrialize the production and to develop if we want to, to, to meet the challenge. And fourth, key priorities, obviously, develop, still develop and support agroecology practices, research, among which research on agricultural landscapes, and Christian so, uh, told some um, example of disruptive approach of uh, agricultural uh, landscapes tomorrow. Um, the, the transversal point is probably we have shown that uh, today. If we want to obtain a significant reduction in the use of pesticides, all these levers should be combined. We have to use and test also them together. That's why we need to invest in experimental infrastructures uh, to combine and uh, to test together all these levers. And we have already examples of such uh, infrastructures. Um, I think uh, to the European project, IPM work, uh, which is dedicated to farm demonstration and peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. Uh, so, uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Jean-Éric Paquet and some of you will uh, discover our CASIS platform, uh, collaborative research and experimentation to experiment agroecology at different scales. Uh, I know that we have a similar facility uh, running in uh, Germany by ZALF. So it's important for European Commission and for government to support uh, basic research, but also demonstration farms. Uh, it's important also for me to mention here uh, that data pooling and sharing should not be limited to these experimental devices. It's essential to secure and to ensure free access for scientists to pesticide use and characteristic. It's not, it's not uh, today really the case, and we miss that. 
And we, we need to access also more broadly to data related to agricultural practices. And the colleague from GRC has spoke of that, and that's a, a good point, and we have to, to progress. Um, last point on research. I think we need uh, in the Horizon Europe program to see ambitious objective of pesticide reduction. Uh, Horizon Europe should be completely aligned with the Green Deal objective. That will uh, help us, all the uh, scientific uh, community, to be ambitious. We know that it's sometimes difficult in our countries, in our member states, to propose that kind of project, disruptive project, if the European Commission puts that um, on uh, Horizon Europe, that will help us. Second message is around the connection between agroecology, uh, agroecological transition and food transition. And yes, already speak of that uh, key point. Uh, it's clear that if we want to obtain a strong reduction in the use of pesticide, we need to simultaneously activate all these levers at the field, at the farm level, but also throughout the production consumption continuum. And fortunately, uh, sometimes we have convergent solutions, good for agriculture, good for food, good for health. Um, we can be optimistic at that uh, uh, time uh, uh, of the day. Uh, a good example uh, is uh, protein uh, production. We, we know that if we want to go towards healthy diet for people in the world and in Europe, we have to rebalance the animal and vegetable protein uh, regime. And so we have to develop uh, protein crops. And if we develop protein crops, it's good for the agroecology uh, uh, transition. It's good also for the diversification of production for farmers. Third message is uh, around the science-based public policies and science-based innovation. We, we have to foster that. I, I don't say that uh, that's not uh, already the case, but probably we, we should go further. We have uh, had a recent CAP reform with some good points, but maybe not sufficient to accelerate the agroecology transition. And um, evidence-based public policies are needed for adapting regulation for low and sustainable pesticide use, but also for supporting farmers in the transition period. Uh, we know uh, that uh, the transition is risky for farmers. New cropping systems, new management of crop protection may induce change uh, in product characteristics in the transition period, you can also face some uh, loss of yields, some, some years. So, and the farmers are, uh, fear that. So we have to help them to take the risk and to engage the transition. It's really necessary, and Agnès insists on that, to create added value and uh, to uh, be sure that uh, all the stakeholders of the value chain are uh, endorsing that transition. You cannot just say to the farmer, you have to go to the zero percent pesticide. The consumer is asking that and uh, all the processing food industry and retailers say it's not our business. If, if we stay in that uh, stage, uh, nothing will, uh, will change. And to prepare the uh, stakeholders um, large mobilization, research and innovation has something to do and we have spoken also of that, uh, with um, uh, open innovation, and European Commission is helping uh, that, so thank you, Jean-Éric. Horizon Europe program already support open innovation project, Living Labs. Uh, I think it's a good way to test, to prepare uh, the big transition. Uh, here in Dijon, uh, we could um, highlight uh, the project uh, led by the Metropole de Dijon, on sustainable food and agroecological transition, which associates a wide research community and many stakeholders from production, from farmers up to uh, uh, processing food and, uh, and food consumption. I think we, we, we should generalize that kind of uh, approaches if we want to scale up the agroecology uh, transition. To conclude, um, um, I would Obviously, thanks all, all of you. Uh, first, all the speakers, 
also participant in the poster session with very enlightening results and discussion on the road ahead. I would to um, give a warm uh, thank to the organizer, our colleague from uh, INRAE, uh, in charge of uh, European uh, affairs. Um, to uh, thank also uh, warmly Dijon, Dijon City, and the uh, region Bourgogne-Franche-Comté, welcoming us uh, in, uh, with that beautiful weather. And after, we will have the, the opportunity to go to, to the mayor, and uh, I think that will be a, a good time. Many thanks to Christian Huig. Maybe uh, we could uh, applause Christian and all the Alliance partners for the organization. Uh, thank you uh, all uh, scientific colleagues coming from all over Europe. Uh, it's really encouraging for, for us to, to, to see you here. And um, we are really happy to share with you a recent news, a good news, the success of the alliance to a cost call with the project Top Agri Network towards Zero Pesticide Agriculture European Network for Sustainability has been selected. That result will uh, allow us to keep working in good conditions and to go on uh, the conclusion of this meeting. And to finish, really, uh, my last uh, warm thank is to Jean-Éric Paquet for his presence here today, but for also with his team, all the support and the listening for, on these uh, major topics. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Philippe, uh, for, for this conclusion and the key messages. And I invite uh, Jean-Éric Paquet uh, to, to join me. So Jean-Éric is uh, General Director of the DG Research and Innovation in, the, in Brussels. And uh, so he's our boss, to say. <laughs> so Jean-Éric, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christian. Thank you very much. And thank you also to Philippe. Well, the bosses are in the room, huh? because um, the research is not carried out in my offices in Brussels. But uh, wherever you are working um, across Europe, um, and also in INRAE and other parts here in Dijon. Uh, Philippe, thank you very much. Um, colleagues, colleagues, you spent most of the afternoon in this, uh, in this room. So um, I can tell you there's a glorious sunshine indeed outside, where I spent most of my afternoon uh, visiting uh, Dijon, which is a, a quite a remarkable place. So I will try to be relatively, I will be compact, allowing us then uh, maybe to exchange more informally as we indeed move downtown. I think um, the first thing to, to say is uh, that indeed the European Green Deal, as Commissioner Wojciechowski set out in his opening video this morning, is um, a very ambitious, uh, certainly very ambitious if you compare it to uh, the previous frameworks under which Europeans were uh, coming together on, uh, on food um, uh, systems. So we moved the cursor uh, in a completely different place. I mean, admittedly, the discussion is still ongoing whether we have uh, at EU level the regulatory and policy framework which is robust enough indeed to achieve uh, these ambitious targets. And there will be a lot of uh, progress, I have no doubt, on the uh, EU legislation on biodiversity, uh, on soils, um, on pesticides in the coming weeks and months as the legislative package of the Green Deal continues to be discussed between Parliament and Council. But we are in a, in a, in a different place. And I think here, uh, for me, the, the main message from these policy developments is that uh, research, and research of course connected uh, to the uh, actors of the sectors, connected of course also to uh, citizens on a broader basis, that that research also needs to change tack. And I think this is very much what the uh, European Research Alliance on, on Pesticide-Free Agriculture is all about. So changing tack in the sense of um, moving uh, beyond um, uh, knowledge production, which is um, producing incremental solutions, I think what is really required today, but you said it in the two panels, and I think these are also the messages uh, which Philippe summed up and which the scientific uh, committee of this conference is putting forward, is we need disruption. I mean, there will be a degree of incremental improvements uh, by actors across Europe, uh, but I think actors, be it consumers, uh, be it the logistics chain or the distribution system, but of course also uh, farmers across Europe, I think know 
uh, but need to be supported to move from improvements to disruptive changes, allowing us effectively uh, to meet at least the 2030 objectives. And let's not forget, we are looking at 2030, but in reality, we are set out uh, to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. And uh, on the way, uh, the biodiversity loss, I think, is an equally existential threat, not completely recognized politically, unfortunately, yet, but I think of a totally uh, similar magnitude. And uh, across the IPCC reports to which some of you contribute, it is absolutely obvious that 2050 is a good target. But the reality is that we need to go much beyond by 2030 and effectively be there worldwide uh, by, by 2050. And that requires disruption. I think incremental improvements across society, across the economy, uh, will not uh, cut it. We need much more than that. And this is where research um, uh, certainly plays an absolutely key role. There were interesting discussions in the panels on trade-offs uh, and uh, systemic uh, challenges uh, beyond agriculture. I mean, they are very much uh, at the heart, I think, of the dilemmas in terms of uh, policy making and transformation of society. And these complexity and these systemic challenges which require intern systemic uh, solutions, uh, scientists and research are, I think, uniquely and uh, uniquely, genuinely uniquely placed uh, to provide um, uh, that basic knowledge. So I think that's what we need to start from, looking at urgency, ambition, disruption, systemic approaches to collectively uh, and effectively start to make a difference. So now the question is, uh, are we up to that agenda uh, as, um, as, as, as science producers? Uh, are we up to that uh, agenda as a science uh, policy maker? I think when I look at, uh, at the uh, European Research Alliance, uh, and I will say now a few words, of course, also of uh, Horizon Europe and European policies, I think at least uh, in terms of our ambition and, and structures and funding to an extent also, I would say yes. But of course, this does not guarantee uh, that we will indeed then fully deliver. It can only be done if uh, the broad agenda and the policy priorities are then uh, designed, fine-tuned, and of course implemented by you in society, as I think is the key um, argument of uh, uh, today's conference. So in, in, in Horizon Europe, I don't think I need to say a lot. You, many of you, I'm sure, are part of uh, de deploying European research for a long time. And of course, on the Horizon 2020, uh, there was no, 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 no shortage in terms of attention and funding for food and agricultural research. Uh, we have a, a 2030 food strategy, um, uh, I think, uh, established in Plovdiv uh, two or three years ago. Philippe, you were there as well. Uh, very much based on Horizon 2020 work done uh, across Europe. And in Horizon Europe, um, we will uh, have more uh, resources, but also more instruments uh, available to support the research policy agenda, which I'm uh, briefly setting out now starting uh, with uh, Cluster 6, uh, the one on agriculture, environment, uh, nature, water, which is uh, better funded than ever. It's the biggest increase in, in Horizon Europe as compared to the previous program. So I think it's nearly 10 billion euros over the period, uh, of which uh, at least one third would be dedicated to uh, food, agriculture, and uh, funding these challenges. And under that broad headline, uh, there is also a lot of attention, which I think we need to put on the rest of Horizon Europe, on Cluster 5, on energy and climate, completely linked, obviously, to agricultural policy, on Cluster 4, on digital solutions, industrial needs as well, again, completely linked uh, through the bioeconomy with the work done um, on, on agriculture and on food. Cluster 1 on health is obviously not, I don't need to, to say why, but also Cluster 2 on societal challenges, governance, democracy, all these um, parts of research they do connect and provide insights and systemic knowledge which we will need to try to combine. So we will, of course, have a responsibility as Commission uh, pilots, if you want, of the program. But I think the message for me and to you this afternoon is don't confine yourself to Cluster 6. Look um, in across disciplines, across sectors, also at the rest of the program and team up uh, to bring in uh, the challenge of a pesticide uh, uh, free agriculture uh, across the rest of the program.
Now, we will, of course, also have two partnerships, which I think very much echo uh, the European Research Alliance, um, uh, which, which is at the basis of today's conference. One on sustainable food systems for people, planet and climate, which focuses very much on healthy diets and um, safe and sustainably produced and consumed resilient food. That's a partnership which I hope some of you are aware of. The timeline is that we want to have it in place next year in 23, which means that the work uh, is happening now with key players in Europe, um, administrations, but also main research actors. The second partnership is on uh, accelerating farming systems transition uh, across agroecology agri living labs and research infrastructures. I mean, this was an important point in the panel uh, this afternoon, that you need to also create platforms to continue to connect uh, the findings which exist in reality across uh, Europe. So these two partnerships, I think, will be uh, certainly uh, relevant in these systemic and I hope much more disruptive uh, uh, research platforms to help you um, produce the knowledge and the solutions which are needed. And I finish with um, the greatest novelty in, in Horizon Europe, which is the, the notion of a European mission. You know that we kicked off in September last year a mission on European soils. The idea is to restore the quality of our soils in Europe, obviously essentially agricultural land. And the idea here is, um, is not just to do research. Of course, there will be a research agenda. I mean, between three and 400 million euros will be available um, in the next few years to support the research for that mission. But the idea is to really go one step further and do what you've been discussing this afternoon, which is, it, which is to ensure that we connect the research and the knowledge and the solutions on a territorial basis. So we want 100, um, I mean, we have called them lighthouses for a number of institutional political reasons, but in fact what we are looking for is 100 regions in Europe uh, which want uh, to engage with the platform of the mission in uh, profoundly transforming their agricultural practices um, to and 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 you know f starting with with farming practices but beyond to restore the quality of the soil in that region and I think around uh, these 100 um, regions in Europe, 100 lighthouses, we will also have a, an extremely powerful uh, platform uh, to exchange uh, the good practices uh, to ensure that we have a pesticide-free uh, agroecology and um, an agriculture which uh, uh, with these um, uh, um, traits, which are the ones expected by large part of society, also allow us to feed uh, our population in a socially fair way and be relevant on a worldwide scale. Uh, against the food crisis of today, I think this remains a particularly important point of attention as well. So that's what uh, I think we are doing together. And so here again, Philippe and Christian, thank you very much for allowing me to say a few words this afternoon. And I'm very much looking forward and my teams as well to interact with uh, all of you in uh, developing these partnerships, this mission and generating great research and sharing it openly across Europe. Thank you very much.